All right, welcome to the notes called Creating a Good Graph. So what we're going to be learning is um, what a good graph is going to include and what you need to make sure that your graph um, has before you, you know, start to analyze it and definitely before you turn it in or you know, put it down on your um, test. Okay, so next test or, or next assignment where you have to make a graph you're going to want to make sure that you include all the stuff that we're going to talk about. Now, if um, I'm going too fast for the lecture, please be sure that uh, if you're not done with writing down the slides, that you pause between um, or after the slide before I get to the next one. All right, so before we actually talk about graphing, um, in order to make a good graph, you need to have good data. So um, we have been talking about uh, data and how to organize it. So let's put this uh, officially in our notes. So the first question is, how should I organize my data during an experiment? Well, scientists, um, you know, when they design an experiment, they're going to uh, look for a cause and effect relationship between the independent and the dependent variable, right? Remember, the independent variable is the variable that stands alone and is not changed by any other variables that you're trying to measure. Now, a dependent variable is the variable that depends on other factors. So if you remember in um, one of the activities that we did, we said that volume is the independent variable. Right? So volume was the independent variable because um, that was, uh, you know, the one that was, you know, stands alone. It's not changed by the mass. So, like, the mass of something is going to depend on how much you have of it. And so that volume is the independent variable, whereas the mass was the dependent variable because, again, the mass depends on how much volume or how much of a substance you have. The more volume you have, the more mass it's going to be. And you can actually see that um, on this chart here. Okay, so when you're organizing your graph, um, this first graph that we see, if we take a look at the independent and dependent variables, they, are, they don't show a nice pattern. Okay, it goes from uh, six to so two to six to ten, which increases, but then it decreases when you get to eight, increases at fourteen, decreases at four, and increases again at twelve. Okay, so there's not a clear relationship between volume and mass. Okay, it's not clear in this one, but in the second one, if we organize the same data instead of by group number, okay, so if we ignore group number and we actually organize it by um, our independent variable, which is volume, we can see that as volume increases, so does mass. Mass also increases. So we can see that there is a clear relationship, right, in this second data table. All right, there's a clear relationship between volume and mass. And so when you are um, creating data tables, um, be sure that you are... Um, always uh, organizing it by your independent variable. Okay, so organize it by the independent variable so that you can easily see any relationships that are apparent during the experiment. All right, so if you're not done with this um, slide, please uh, pause before you go on to the next. All right, so after you organize your data well, then you need to figure out what kind of graph to choose. Um, so scientists use graphs to clearly illustrate whether or not there's a relationship between the variables. So we saw in the mass and volume of the last slide that there was a clear relationship between mass and volume. As volume increases, mass increases. So what's the best way okay, to illustrate this? What kind of graph should we use? Well, for most cases... Okay, you're going to use what's called a scatter plot. Okay, we think lines and dots. All right. Um, so most of the time, you're going to be using a line graph or scatter plot. You can use a bar graph, but here are two important. There's basically only two times you should be using a bar graph. 
if the independent variable is non-numeric, like you're sorting by color or sport or, um, I don't know, hair length or something like that, um, and you're not using any numbers, okay, so if it's non-numeric, like this graph here, our favorite sport, and they ask people what their favorite sports were. Well, soccer, softball, basketball, other, those are not numeric numbers, so we can use a bar graph. Um, also, um, if we want to know, the other option is we, we want to know how often something happens, right? So that's what we call a histogram. And um, this uh, one right here is showing the frequency of the height of black cherry trees, okay? So, um, you know, here we do have numbers on the um, independent variable, the x-axis, but it is very discrete. So every time we saw a cherry tree that was 60 uh, feet in length, we would count it, okay? Every time it was about ni uh, 90 feet in length, you'd count it. So this is kind of just gives you a frequency of what's happening, okay? But in um, the previous example where we had mass and volume, okay, it's actually better to use a uh, scatter plot so that you can definitely see, so this is an example, um, this one right here is an example of a scatter plot, all right? So you can see um, volume was our independent and mass is our dependent, and we can see that we have a kind of a nice straight line, not super straight, but if we did a best fit line, we could see that it, it uh, trends upwards. So as mass increases, or I'm sorry, as volume increases, mass also increases. And we can see that clearly on um, this scatter plot. Okay, so um, this one is also an example of a scatter plot. These ones, the dots aren't um, exactly lined up, okay, but we can, um, you know, maybe kind of do a best fit line, all right, to kind of get as many dots as we can. And we can see that, yeah, maybe there might be a, a slightly re slight relationship between leg length and sprint time, all right. Um, it's not as tight as uh, this example here with the mass and volume, but um, some could argue that there would be some kind of relationship. In either case, we're using the right kind of graph to represent our data. So if we have numbers for um, both the independent and dependent variables, okay, so time and length are both number measurements, we're going to be using the scatter plot. Um, if we don't have um, <clears throat> numeric numbers for one of them, like here, we had the uh, soccer ball, softball, basketball, or if you had colors or something like that, um, then we would definitely use a bar graph. All right, so if you haven't finished um, jotting down these notes, please pause now. All right, so we've organized our data. We've chosen what kind of graph we're going to uh, make, whether it's a bar graph or a scatter plot. And now we need to set that up. All right, so. Um, the first thing you want to do is on your on your paper is to draw an x and a y axis. Okay, so um, for for this you just you know draw a nice like L shape for an x and a y axis, and then you're going to identify. Um, hopefully, you know what in the, the independent variable versus the dependent variable is. Um, but if you don't, just ask yourself what depends on the other. Okay, so for example, if we take a look at this graph E, leg length versus sprint time. So you would ask yourself, does the leg length depend on the sprint time or does the sprint time depend on the leg length? Well, it makes more sense that your time would depend on how long your legs are, okay, versus how long your legs are depending on time of sprints. That doesn't make sense, right? So your um, independent variable okay, is going to be your leg length. So I'll put IV for independent variable. And your dependent variable, dependent variable, DV, is going to be your sprint time because the time depends on the length. So depends meaning it's a dependent variable. All right, so when you graph, the independent variable is always on the x-axis. Independent variable, x-axis. 
Okay, so here leg length is on the x-axis. Um, for this bar graph, graph D, we had um, colors. And so if we think about it, the, the number of, of um, candies is going to depend on what color you have in the bag, right? So that means your independent variable is on the x-axis, and this time it's color, right? And so um, that is going to be shown on the x-axis. Now, on the y-axis is your dependent variable. So over here in graph E, we said time was dependent on your leg length. So that means your y-axis is going to be your dependent variable, and we're going to put time there. Um, and for graph D, we said that the number of candies depends on the color. And so again, the number of candies is on the y-axis here. Okay, so your y-axis is for your dependent variable, okay? Now, here is a huge thing that you need to make sure that you keep in mind. A lot of people um, forget this, and a lot of people forgot this on the test too, okay? Your labels must include the name of the axis and the unit, right? So, for example... In graph E, the name of the x-axis is leg length, and the unit is centimeters. You need both. All right. For the y-axis, the name is sprint time, and the unit is seconds. Okay, because if you don't put the seconds and you just put time, are you talking about minutes, hours, days? Right. So you need to make sure that you put um, the units down. All right. Now, for a bar graph where there is no measurement, okay, so um, I would suggest you put color, and then your unit would be which color. Each of these individual colors would kind of be like a unit on um, that particular axis. All right, and here we've got a number of candies, so we're going to have um, numbers there. All right, and, you know, numbers of candies are very discrete. We just call it number of candies, so that works. Okay, so please, please, please don't forget your name and the unit. All right, so you can pause it now if you're still writing the notes. All right, so once you've um, drawn your X and Y axis and you've labeled them with a name for each um, variable, the independent and dependent variable, and you put down the unit for your variables, now you can number your x-axis, okay, and your y-axis. You can number them if, for example, it's, you know, a um, scatter plot, okay? And then you could also number it if one of your axes on your bar graph, one of the axes should be numbers, and so you can number them as well. So here's something to remember about numbering. Um, <clears throat> when you number your axis, make sure you use appropriate scaling. This is key. If you have a small range of numbers, you want to make sure your scale is not too big, okay, um, so that, you know, all of your data is kind of like really, really low. So like, for example, this bar graph here, um, you know, is probably not the best scale to use because look, all of these little numbers, you can't even tell what they are, right? So the scaling going by 20,000 each time, 20,000, 40,000, 60,000, 80,000, 100,000, um, probably wasn't such a smart idea. Perhaps they went by 10,000s or even 5,000s so that we can actually kind of, you know, see clearly these, um, you know, smaller measurements here, okay? So make sure that you use appropriate scaling. Um, <clears throat> if, uh, if you need to, then use decimal intervals if needed. So, like, if you've got, um, you know, all of your data falls between 0 and 3.0, on your graph, you may be going by 0.5s, okay, or maybe even by 0.1s, all right, depending on how, you know, big of a graph you want to make. Um, but make sure that you use appropriate scaling. And then, um, <clears throat> most of the time, graphs, you know, can start at 0, 0. But it, they don't have to. 
All right. So on the left here, we see two different graphs. They actually um, give the same information. Average SAT of incoming freshmen. This graph starts at zero. This graph starts at 1600. All right. And so um, we can see that, you know, it's not super necessary to start at zero. You could start at 1600 uh, because there's nothing really less than that. So um, for your graphs, not necessarily always start at zero, zero. And then um, last but not least, make sure that you're not misleading your audience by choosing the wrong scale. Okay, so between these two graphs here, all right, um, you know, <clears throat> it may mislead um, the audience saying, oh my gosh, college A, the average SAT is so much lower than college D. Okay, but if you actually look at the numbers, Okay, this one is about 1,700, and this one is 2,400. That's only a difference of 700. So that's not that much when you're talking about thousands and thousands of um, points on the SAT, right? So um, don't mislead your audience when choosing your scale. All right, so if you are not done with this slide, please pause now to finish up. All right, so in our graph, we have good data. We have chosen what kind of graph we're gonna use. We have um, put down our X and Y axes. We have the units and the, the name for our X and Y axes. We um, have put the scaling down. We know it's right and it's um, a good scale uh, rather than making it too big or too small. And so now we are actually ready to plot our points. So the next part of making a good graph is plotting your points. And there's just a few um, reminders for you. Be sure you are accurate in plotting your points. Um, making sure that you know, you're know you looking at the right scale, or the, sorry, the right axes for each number and not plotting the inverse. So you know, if you've got uh, your x, oops, if you've got your x value as you know 3.0 and your y value as uh, 10, right? If you're looking on your x and y graph, oh, that looks like a, hold on, that looks like a x as well. So x and y graph, you want to make sure that your x value, right, is the correct here, and you're looking at your y value on this part of the scale and not flip-flopping them, right? So um, if you put, you know, 10 over here for 10, X and only 3Y, your dot may be here. However, you know, it should be 3X and 10Y, so it should be up here. So make sure that you are accurate in your plotting. You're not mixing up um, the X and Y numbers on your graph. And then um, just slow down and double check yourself. You can even, you know, if you are looking at your graph and one of the dots seems really off compared to the others, it probably is. Um, so just recheck the data because you either graphed it wrong or there's actual experimental data and you know either could be the case but just make sure it's not your graphing that's wrong uh, because plotting the wrong points on a graph will lead to the wrong analysis of data and then it will lead to you probably crying like a baby like this guy here. oh man i didn't graph it right so i got the answers wrong okay so don't let this guy be you uh, make sure that you slow down and you are meticulous about how you're plotting your points. All right, so if you still need to write, please pause now. Okay, last but not least, this is the very, very last thing you need to make sure that you will have on your graph is a title. Lots and lots and lots of people always forget the title. Please don't forget the title. The title is um, very important because if you have a lot of graphs in a like a, a scientific paper that you're writing or even um, in a big lab analysis that you're doing, you want to make sure that you label what your graph is. You title it because um, you're probably going to have more than one graph for all the different tests that you're doing. And if you don't label it, then not, they're not going to know which one goes with what data. So the title is super important. Always be sure you title your graph. Your title needs to include both variables. Okay, so make sure you include both variables in your title. Um, <clears throat> so for example, this is a 
graph about automobile speed and the average cost of a ticket. So here's one option for a title. The dependence of traffic ticket cost on automobile speed. See, we had both of them. We had cost from here, our y-axis, and we have speed from our x-axis. So we include both variables in our title. All right. Now, if you can't, this is kind of like what I uh, call quote unquote fancy title. If you can't think of any kind of fancy title, then just at least put down your y versus x. Okay, so for example, your whatever you've got um, labeled as your y axis, put that down and then put a little versus symbol and then put whatever your label is for your x axis. So you could have, you know, just as easily called this graph cost of average speeding ticket versus automobile speed. That would be a perfectly fine title too. It's telling you the two different variables that were measured in this data, right? So please, please, please don't forget the title of your graph. All right, so this is the last slide. So if you're not done, um, just pause it now before it ends. And if you are done, then that's fabulous. We'll see you next time.